I'm going to learn some more uh, anarchist history. I think we were up to Proudhon uh, was the next section that we were going to be reading about. All right, so we're at Proudhon and Stirner. So we've got uh, <laughs> Frenchman Pierre Joseph Proudhon is regarded as the founder of modern anarchism, a label he adopted in his groundbreaking work, What is Property? Or an inquiry into the principle of right and government. I'm not going to try and read the French of that. It was published in 1840. In it, he asks, what is property? A question that he answers with the famous accusation, property is theft. Proudhon's theory of mutualism rejects the state, capitalism, and communism. It calls for a cooperative society in which the free associations of individuals are linked in a decentralized federation based on a bank of the people that supplies workers with free credit. He contrasted this with what he called possession, or limited ownership of resources and goods, only while in more or less continuous use. Later, Proudhon also added that property is liberty, and that argued that it was a bulwark against state power. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Mutualists would later play an important role in the First International, especially at the first two congresses held in Geneva and Lausanne, Lausanne? but diminished in the European influence with the rise of anarcho-communism. Instead, mutualism would find fertile ground among American individualists in the late 19th century. In Spain, Ramon de la Sagra established the anarchist journal El Povenir uh, in 1845. I'm, I'm terrible with uh, languages that aren't English, but uh, which was inspired by Proudhon's ideas Catalan politician Franceschi P. E. Margal became the principal translator of Proudhon's work into Spanish. He would later briefly become president of Spain in 1873, while leader of the Democratic Republican Federal Party, where he tried to impl implement some of Proudhon's ideas. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, instead of going on to Sterner, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna check out uh, the Proudhon wiki page. Ch -ch -ch -ch. So he was born 15th January 1809. Uh, looks like he died 19th of January 1865. So that's relatively young. He was a French socialist, politician, philosopher, economist, and a founder of the mutualist philosophy, which we can go into in another time. He was the first person to declare himself an anarchist. Oh, yeah, I better. Sorry, I'm going to share this tab instead. <laughs> he was the first person to declare himself an anarchist using that term and is widely regarded as one of anarchists most influential theorists Proudhon is considered by many to be the father of anarchism Proudhon became a member of the French parliament after the revolution of 1848 where after he referred to himself as a federalist Proudhon described the liberty he pursued as the synthesis of community and property some consider his mutualism to be part of individualist anarchism, while others regard it to be part of social anarchism, which is uh, something that non-anarchists don't really get the division. <laughs> social anarchism and, and individualism anarchism. So again, this is something I hope to come back to at another time. Proudhon was born in Besancon? Besancon? I don't know. He was a printer who taught himself Latin in order to better print books in the language. His best known assertion is that property is theft, contained in his first major work, What is Property? or An Inquiry into the Principal Right of Government, which perhaps we'll read someday. <laughs> it was published in 1840. The book's publication attracted the attention of the French authorities. It also attracted the scrutiny of Karl Marx, who started a correspondence with its author. And the two influenced each other, and they met in Paris while Marx was exiled there. Their friendship finally ended when Marx responded to Proudhon's The System of Economic Contradictions, or The Philosophy of Poverty, with the provocatively titled The Poverty of Philosophy. Ugh. Fucking shit posters, eh? <laughs> the dispute became one of the sources of the split between the anarchist and Marxist wings of the International Working Men's Association. Some, such as Edmund Wilson, have contended that Marx's attack on Proudhon had its origin in the latter's defense of Karl Grun, which Mar who Marx bitterly disliked, but who had been pre preparing translation of Proudhon's work. Proudhon favored workers' council and associations or cooperatives, as well as individual worker-peasant possession over private ownership, 
or the nationalization of land and workplaces. He considered social revolution to be achievable in a peaceful manner. <clears throat> social revolution is also another subject that uh, needs a bit further explanation uh, and exploration because uh, non-anarchists don't really get it or like uh, like liberals for sure generally don't they don't know what we mean. So anyway, Proudhon unsuccessfully tried to create a national bank to be funded by what became an abortive attempt at an income tax on capitalists and shareholders. Similar in some respects to a credit union, it would have given interest-free loans. After the death of his follower, Mikhail Bukunin, who is also somebody we will have to read up on, Proudhon's libertarian socialism diverged into individualist anarchism, collectivist anarchism, anarcho-communism, and anarcho-syndicalism with notable proponents such as Carlo Caffiero, Joseph Dejac, Peter Kropotkin, and Benjamin Tucker. So I don't know, I don't know how much I got to go into who Proudhon was. It's not, uh, I don't know. I don't really, I mean, I'm an anarchist. We don't worship people, right? <laughs> like he was, he was a person who, who wrote a lot of, wrote some cool stuff and had some cool ideas and Maybe we can take some of those ideas and use them and maybe some of these ideas we don't need to keep. And maybe it'd be worth reading a little bit into his life at another time, but I don't, I don't really need to, I don't feel the need to go into the, um, the, uh, biography of, uh, <laughs> Proudhon. Uh, so we got an influential form of individualist ag anarchism called egoism or egoist anarchism was expounded on one of the earliest and yeah, let's, let's open that a new tab too. I'll save these links and I'll, uh, I'll check them out. Another day was expounded by one of the earliest and best known proponents of individualist anarchism, German philosopher, Max Stirner. Stirner's The Ego and Its Own, <coughs> excuse me, published in 1844, is a founding text of the philosophy. Stirner was critical of capitalism as it creates class warfare, where the rich will exploit the poor using the state as its tool. He also rejected religions, communism, and liberalism, as all of them subordinate individuals, all of them subordinate individuals to God, a collective, or the state. <clears throat> According to Stirner, the only limitation on the rights of the individual is the power to obtain what they desire without regard for the God, state, or morality. See, this is why I disagree with individualism and egoism like that. <sighs> Sorry, bud. Uh, you have to take other people into account. That's just fucking like, like Bakunin said, like, like you can't be free unless the other people around you are free. We are all in this together. He said, he held that society does not exist, but that individuals are its reality. That's, it's a false dichotomy, man. Cerner advocated self-assertion and foresaw unions of egoists, non-systematic associations continually renewed by all parties support through an act of will, which proposed as form of organization in place of the state. Egoist anarchists claim that egoism will foster genuine and spontaneous union between individuals. <laughs> Sterner was, yeah, I mean, not egoism though. It's not egoism. It's communalism, but whatever. Anyway, Sterner was proposing an individual rebellion, which would not seek to establish new institutions, nor resemble anything resembling a state. All right, let's check out Stirner because he's he's important. I disagree with what I know about an egoism. I'm not an expert in it by any stretch. I haven't I haven't read his books. Uh, what I know of it, I'm not that interested. Uh, claims like yeah. Anyway, but let's check him out. He's still very important to the history of anarchism and individualist anarchism is part of anarchism, right? Like I don't want to dismiss an entire segment of anarchists just because I disagree with certain things that uh, Stirner said or certain things that other egoists have said. Sorry about that. I needed a drink. Uh, so Johann Kaspar Schmidt, born in October 25th, 1806, uh, died June 26th, 1856, known professionally as Max Stirner, was a German post-Hegelian philosopher dealing mainly with the Hegelian notion of social alienation and self-consciousness. Stirner is often seen as one of the forerunners of nihilism, existentialism, psychoanalytic theory, postmodernism, and individualist anarchism. <sighs> yeah, okay. 
I mean, these all these all deserve examination. I'm not a nihilist. <laughs> Sterner's main work, The Ego and Its Own, was first published in 1844 in Leipzig and has since appeared in numerous editions and translations. And then he's got his biography as well, which I just, again, I didn't go through it with Proudhon. I don't feel like, maybe, let's go, let's go with through the philosophy a little bit. Mm, did I open a new tab for egoism? I did. Okay. Or egoist anarchism. Let's go. Sterner, whose main philosophical work was the ego in its own, is credited as a major influence in the development of nihilism, existentialism, and postmodernism as well as individualist anarchism, post-anarchism, and post-left anarchy. Although Stirner was opposed to communism for the same reasons he opposed capitalism, humanism, liberalism, property rights, and nationalism, seeing them as forms of authority over the individual and as purveyors of ideologies he could not reconcile himself with, he has influenced many anarcho-communists and post-left anarchists. The writers of An Anarchist Fact report that many in the anarchist movement in Glasgow, Scotland, took Stirner's Union of Egoists literally as a basis for the anarcho-syndicalist organizing in the 1940s and beyond. Similarly, the noted anarchist historian Max Natlow states that, On reading Stirner, I maintain that he cannot be interpreted except in a socialist sense. <laughs> so, Stirner was anti-capitalist and pro-labor, attacking the division of labor resulting from private property for its defending, deadening effects on the ego and the individuality of, individuality of the worker and writing that free competition is not free because I lack the things for competition. Under the regime of commonality, the laborers always fall into the hands of the possessors of, cap of the capitalists. The laborer cannot realize on his, realize on his labor to the ex extent the va of the value that it has for the customer. The state rests on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. I mean, that's all solid. That's all pretty fucking like solid stuff. For Stirner, labor has an egoistic character. The laborer is the egoist. Stirner did not personally oppose the struggles carried out by certain ideologies such as socialism, Ludwig Feuerbach's humanism, or the advocacy of human rights. Rather, he opposed their legal and ideal abstractness, and a fact that made him different from the liberal individualists, including the anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians, but also from the Ubermensch theories of fascism as he placed the individual and not the sacred collective at the center. About socialism, Stirner wrote in a letter to Moses Hess that I am not against, at all against socialism, but against concerted, consecrated socialism. My selfishness is not opposed to love, nor is it an enemy of sacrifice, nor of self-denial, and least of all, of socialism. In short, it is not an enemy of true interests. It rebels not against love, but against sacred love, not against thought, but against sacred thought, not against socialists, but against sacred socialism. Yeah, I don't mind that. That's pretty good. I, I find that, uh, I mean, I, I also have a trouble with like the hardcore collectivist type stuff with like where you get, uh, you get your, your, and not to, not to straw man them, but there are some Leninists on Twitter who like are like, hey, well, you fall in line or you get the wall. And I'm just not into that. Like you don't get to do that. We we all have to play some role. We all have to agree to our role. We all have to take care of ourselves, but we we will take care of others because this is how humans work. It's not. Uh, and maybe I'm not that far off of Sterner anyway. Sterner's egoism ar argues that individuals are impossibly impossible to fully comprehend, as no understanding of the self can adequately describe the fullness of experience. Stirner has been broadly understood as the as containing traits of both psychological egoism and rational egoism. Unlike the self-interest described by Ayn Rand, Stirner did not address self -interest, individual self-interest, selfishness, or prescriptions of how one should act. He urged individuals to decide for themselves and fulfill their own egoism. He believed that everyone was propelled by their own egoism and desires and that those who accept this as willing egoists could freely live their individual desires while those who did not, as unwilling egoists, will falsely believe they are fulfilling another cause while they are secretly fulfilling their own desires for happiness and security. Again, not too bad, actually. <laughs> That's pretty solid. <laughs> uh, the willing egoist would see that they could act freely, unbound from obedience to sacred but artificial truths like law, rights, morality, and religion. See, I just don't see how you can throw morality in there and call it like, 
artificial truth. There are things that even, even if you're an ego, I, I don't know, I, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but even if you are a fully self-realized individual who is pure freedom and does whatever you want, you still don't like, it's still morally wrong to kill another person. Like, it's still morally wrong, you know, without, uh, you know, who's just existing. Like that's not threatening you in some way. Right. So I don't know. Maybe I'm getting this wrong. Maybe I'm misinterpreting some of this, but uh, power is the method of Stern's egoism and the only justified method of gaining philosophical property. Sterner did not believe in a one-track pursuit of greed, which ha has only one as has has only one aspect of the ego, would lead to being possessed by a cause rather other than the full ego. He did not believe in natural rights to property and encouraged insurrection against all forms of authority, including disrespect for property. Okay, yeah, you got me. <laughs> that part's dead on. Um, I wonder if I should have, I suppose it's probably a little too late, but is there a philosophy section for decision to pursue philosophy? I'm just checking out uh, Proudhon. Yeah, he's got a philosophy section. Maybe we'll we'll finish up uh, Sterner's uh, philosophy section. Oh, God damn it. I'm going to have to like completely redo this. Like, for uh for for the YouTube video because I forgot to switch tabs again. So I've been reading from the Max Sterner uh uh wiki page. And I skipped over the biography because honestly the biography is not that interesting to me. Um I don't care that much about individual people so much as like what they can contribute to the you know overall thinking of anarchism. I don't worship Sterner. <laughs> I don't worship Proudhon. Um, all right, so we're going to anarchism under Sterner's philosophy. Sterner proposes that commonly accepted social institutions, including the notion of the state, property as a right, natural rights in general, and the very notion of society, were merely illusions or quote unquote spooks or ghosts in the mind. He advocated egoism and a form of amoralism in which individuals would unite in unions of egoists only when it was in their self-interest to do so. For him, property simply comes about through might, saying, whoever knows how to take and defend the thing, to him belongs property. What I have in my power, that is my own. So long as I assert myself as holder, I am the proprietor of the thing. See, this is the kind of, this is the anarchism that people like go, oh yeah, well, uh, You'd be the first to go if if you, the world was anarchist. That's not the anarchism that I advocate for. Like I'm not into this like might makes right nonsense. You crossed the line, bud. He adds that I do not step shyly back from your property, but look uh, upon it always as my property, in which I respect nothing. Pray do the like with you what you call my property. <sighs> yeah, I guess in some ways that's like, it's a it's a pretty aggressive way to like frame like property shouldn't be a thing and like we should all be sharing stuff and like but that's like the way he frames it it's like super aggressive right Sterner considers the world and everything in it including other persons available to one's taking or use without moral constraint and that rights do not exist in regard to objects and people at all yeah I just don't agree man he sees no rationality in taking the interests of others into account unless doing so furthers one's self-interest. Define rationality, man. Like, that's just wrong. Which he believes is the only legitimate reason for acting. Self-interest. That I mean, that's that's just wrong. He denies society as an actual a being, an actual entity, calling society a spook and that individuals are its reality. And despite being labeled as an anarchist, Sterner was not necessarily one. Separation of Sterner and egoism from anarchism was first done in 1914 by Dora Marsden in her debate with Benjamin Tucker. In her journals, The New Free Woman and the Egoist. That sounds interesting. The idea of egoist anarchism has, was also expounded by various other egoists, mainly Malfu Seklu and Sidney E. Parker. Communism. Sterner suggested that communism was tainted with the same idealism as Christianity and infused with superstitious ideas like morality and justice. Sterner's principal critique of socialism and communism was that they ignored the individual. They aimed to hand over the abstraction to the abstraction society, which meant that no existing person actually owned anything. Okay. 
Thurner's principal critique of socialism and communism was that they ignored the individual. Okay. They aimed to hand ownership to the abstraction society, which meant that no existing person actually owned anything. Okay. The anarchist fact writes that while some may object to our attempt to place egoism and communism together, it is worth pointing out that Stirner rejected communism. Stirner did not subscribe to libertarian communism because it did not exist when he was writing, and so he was directing his critique against the various forms of state communism which did exist. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Moreover, this does not mean that anarcho-communists and others may not find his work of use to them. No, I, uh, as it as it stands, like. Some of what I've read in this wiki page seems pretty good. <clears throat> and Stirner would have approved, for nothing could be more foreign to his ideas than to limit what an individual considers to be in their best interest. In summarizing Stirner's main arguments, the writers indicate why social anarchists have been and should be interested in his ideas, saying that John P. Clark presents a sympathetic and useful social anarchist critique of his work in Max Stirner's Egoism. <clears throat> I'm going to open that in a new tab as well. Uh, Daniel Guern wrote that Stirner accepted many of the premises of communism, but with the following qualification. The profession of communist faith is first step towards total emancipation of the victims of our society, but they will be completely disalienated and truly able to develop their individually only by advancing beyond communism. According to author Resno O'Connor's, Red profits to rebrand and turn Stirner into a similar system similar to Marx. <clears throat> Red profits attempt to, you know, okay. He concluded that the relevance of Max Stirner to anarcho communism was to drop the communism part. Ah, yeah, whatever. I mean, if that's the case, then I reject Stirner. If, like, if you can incorporate some of Stirner's ideas into anarcho communism, then I'm on board. But if you have to uh, take all of Stirner or, and reject all of communism, then I'm not on board. Like, it's just like, I don't know, I, I feel like it's a pragmatic kind of like take the best ideas from each of these things and use it to make the best life for everyone. And yes, in some ways, that's in my self-interest because I, I benefit from having a world where everybody is free and, and everybody has what they need and nobody's fighting or, or killing each other over basic needs and nobody's suffering. That is in my best interest. <laughs> the dichotomy is false. I'm sorry. It just is. <laughs> so, all right. So I've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. I've only been doing 30 minutes on anarchist history though, but I spent a lot of time on Stirner. <clears throat> Stirner criticizes conventional notions of revolution, arguing that social movements aimed at overturning established ideals are tacitly idealist because they're implicitly aimed at the establishment of the new ideal thereafter. Stirner criticizes conventional notions of revolution, arguing that social movements aimed at overturning established ideals are tacitly idealist. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Because they are implicitly aimed at the establishment of a new ideal thereafter. <sighs> this shit is fucking nonsense. I'm sorry, you might be a genius, but you just talked yourself into a circle of doing nothing. Like, <laughs> a revolution and insurrection must not be looked upon as synonymous. Okay. The former consists of an overturning of conditions, of the established condition or status, the state or society, and is accordingly a political or a social act. The latter has indeed, for its unavoidable consequence, a transformation of circumstances, yet does not start from it, but from men's disconsent with themselves. It is not an armed rising, but a rising of individuals, a getting up without regard for, to the arrangement that spring up from it. The revolution aimed at new arrangements, insurrection leads us to no longer let ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves. Which is just a new arrangement. Come the fuck on, man. <laughs> and sets no glittering hopes on institutions. Well, yeah, no, we shouldn't have any glittering hopes on institutions. It is not a fight against the established, since if it prospers, the established collapses of itself. It is only a working forth. Yeah, you're just using words differently. like. Come on, this is semantics. No, like, <laughs> if I leave the established, it is it is dead and passes into decay. Yeah, I mean, sure. If we have a social revolution and everybody just gets up and walks away from their jobs, there's nobody working. It's like a tautology, right? Like, if nobody works, nobody's working. The end. Hook. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe it's maybe I'm misinterpreting. Maybe the wiki isn't com complete. Maybe I need to read more. 
All right, the Union of Egoists. Stirner's idea of the Union of Egoists was first expounded in The Ego and Its Own. The Union is understood as a non-systematic association which Stirner proposed in a contradistinction to the state. Unlike a community in which individuals are obli obliged to participate, Stirner's suggested union would be voluntary and instrumental under which individuals would freely associate insofar as others within the union remain useful to each other. <sighs> the union relation between egoists, between egoists is continually renewed by all parties support th through an act of will. Some, such as Svein Olav Nyberg, argue that the union requires that all parties participate out of a conscious egoism, while others, such as Sidney E. Parker, regard the union as a change of attitude, rejecting its previous conception as an institution. I don't know. Some of this stuff, it just seems like he's just twisting things around, like trying to fucking avoid like doing things or holding responsibilities. But... Scholar, okay, so he's got the response to Hegelianism. Scholar Lawrence Stepelovich states that G. W. F. Hegel was a major influence on the ego and its own. While the latter has an un-Hegelian structure and tone on the whole and is hostile to Hegel's conclusions about the self and the world, Stepelovich states that Stirner's work is best understood as answering Hegel's question of the role of consciousness after it has contemplated untrue knowledge and become absolute knowledge. Stepelovich concludes that Stirner presents the consequences of the rediscovering of the rediscovering one's self-consciousness after realizing self-determination. Scholars such as Douglas Mogak and Widdekind de Ritter have stated that Stirner was obviously a student of Hegel, like his contemporaries, Ludwig Feuerbach and Bruno Bauer, but this does not necessarily make him a Hegelian. Contrary to the young Hegelians, Stirner scorned all attempts at an imminent critique of Hegel and the Enlightenment and renounced Bauer and Feuerbach's emancipatory claims as well. Contrary to Hegel, who considered the given as an inadequate embodiment of rational, Stirner leaves, his given, leaves the given intact by considering it a mere object, not of transformation, but of enjoyment and consumption. Mm-hmm. According to Mogak, Stirner does not go beyond Hegel, but in fact leaves the domain of philosophy in its entirety, <laughs> stating, Stirner refused to conceptualize the human self and rendered it devoid of any reference to rationality or universal standards. The self was moreover considered a field of action, a never-being I. The I had no essence to realize, and the life itself was a process of self-dissolution, far from accepting, like humanists, Hegelians, a construal of the subjectivity and endowed with a universal and ethical mission, Cerner's notion of the unique distances itself from any conceptualization whatsoever. There is no development of the concept of unique. No philosophical system can be built out of it as it can out of, can out of being or thinking or the I. Rather, with it, all development of the concept ceases. The person who views it as principle thinks that he can treat it philosophically or theoretically and necessarily waste his breath arguing against it. Okay, so he's got a few works here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. I might have to, I might at some point actually have to read like a little bit more on Sterner and like uh, on uh, read his writing perhaps, or like maybe some uh, some some articles in support, or uh, maybe articles critiquing a little bit of back and forth perhaps. <clears throat> um. Let's see, what else do I want to talk about in this? Like, I, I didn't really go through Proudhon's. Um, let's see that one instead. So this is the Proudhon page still uh, that I'm going back to because I didn't go to his philosophy. Um, anarchism. Proudhon was the first person to refer to himself as an anarchist. Proudhon's anarchist mutualism is considered a middle way or synthesis between individualist anarchism and social, social anarchism. According to Larry Gambon, Proudhon was a social individual <laughs> individualist anarchist. I just think the, the dichotomy is false. Like I just think that, uh, like I've said multiple times, uh, even before I was ever an anarchist, like the individualism thing, like society is comprised of individuals, but that doesn't destroy the existence of society. The collective exists. 
we all feed and are fed by each other in various cultural ways, intellectual ways, um, literal ways. Like we all exist within a society and we are all the making of society. You can't have society without individuals, but you can't have individuals without other individuals. And as soon as you have multiple individuals working together, you have a society. It's just, it seems pretty obvious to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody can explain to me why I'm, I'm where I'm mistaken. But anyway, according to Larry Gemmel, Proudhon was a social individualist anarchist. Both anarcho-communist Peter Kropotkin and individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker defined anarchism as the no-government form of socialism. <clears throat> I like that. And the abolition of the state and the abolition of usury, respectively. In this, Kropotkin and Tr Tucker were following the definition of Proudhon, who stated that we do not admit the government of man by man any more than the exploitation of man by man. Yeah. Yeah. What, in What is Property, published in 1840, Proudhon defined anarchy as the absence of a master, of a sovereign, and wrote that, as man seeks justice in equality, so society seeks order in anarchy. In 1849, Proudhon declared in Confessions of a Revolutionary that whoever lays his hand on me to govern me is an usurper. Uh, usurper? Ursuper? <laughs> what a dumb word. And tyrant, and I declare him my enemy. In The General Idea of Revolution, Proudhon urged a society without authority. In a subchapter called What is Government, Proudhon wrote, To be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law-driven, <coughs> law-driven, numbered, regulated, and ruled, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, checked, estimated, valued, censured, commanded, by creatures who have neither the right nor the wisdom nor the virtue to do so. To be governed is to be at every operation, at every transaction noted, registered, counted, taxed, stamped, measured, numbered, assessed, licensed, authorized, admonished, prevented, forbidden, reformed, corrected, punished. It is under pretext of public utility and in the name of the general interest to be placed under contribution, drilled, fleeced, exploited, monopolized, extorted from squeezed, hoaxed, robbed, then at the slightest resistance, the first word of complaint to be repressed, fined, vilified, harassed, hunted down, abused, clubbed, disarmed, bound, choked, imprisoned, judged, condemned, shot, deported, sacrificed, sold, betrayed, and to crown all mocked, ridiculed, derided, outraged, dishonored. That is government. That is its justice. That is its morality. Which one could say is not actually morality, but is merely power imposed upon other people. Towards this, the end of this, his life, Proudhon modified some of his earlier views. In the principle of federation, Proudhon modified his earlier anti-state position, arguing for the balancing of authority by liberty that put forward a decentralized theory of federal government. Proudhon also defined anarchy differently as the government of each by himself, which meant that political functions have been reduced to industrial functions, and that social order arises from nothing but transactions and exchanges. This work also saw Proudhon call his economic system an agro-industrial federation, arguing that it would provide specific federal arrangements to protect citizens of the federated states from capitalist, industrial feder uh, capitalist and financial feudalism, both within them and from the outside, and so stop the reintroduction of wage labor. This was because political right requires to be, to be buttressed by economic right. In the posthumously, posthumously published Theory of Property, Proudhon argued that property is the only power that can act as a counterweight to the state. Hence, Proudhon could retain the idea of property as theft and, at the same time, offer a new definition of it as liberty. There is a constant po possibility of abuse exploitation which spells theft. At the same time, property is a spontaneous creation of society and a bulwark against the ever-encroaching power of the state. Daniel Guerin criticized Proudhon's later life by stating that many of these masters were not anarchists throughout their lives, and their complete works include passages which have nothing to do with anarchism. Ah. To take example, in the second part of the, his career, Proudhon's thinking took a conservative turn. His verbose and monumental De la Justice dans la Revolution in, I don't know, in 1858, 
was mainly concerned with the problem of religion, and its conclusion was far from libertarian. Dialectics. In What is Property, Proudhon moved on from the rejection of communism and private property in a dialectical manner, looking from a third form looking for a third form of society. This third form of society, the synthesis of communism and property, we will call liberty. Well, that's just not fair. You don't just get to call it. <laughs> like you just this this thing that I'm making up, this is what we're calling freedom. Yeah, you, you guys you guys call you, you, you this you have to follow my association, my uh, thing now. This is this is liberty. This is freedom. This is what I'm calling. Anyway, in his system of economic contradiction, Proudhon described mutuality as the synthesis of the notions of private property and collective ownership. Proudhon's rejection of the compulsory commun communism and privileged property led him towards a synthesis of libertarian communism and possession, just as the apparent contradiction between his theories of property represents an antithesis, which still needs synthesizing. Proudhon stated that in presenting the property is liberty theory, he is not changing his mind about the earlier property is theft definition. Proudhon did not rely on synthesis, but also emphasized balance between approaches such as communism and property that apparently cannot be reconcil reconciled. Yeah, okay. American mutualist William Bachelder Green took a similar approach in his 1849-1850 works. Free association. For Proudhon, mutualism involved free association by creating industrial democracy a system where workplaces would be handed over to democratically organized workers. We want these associations to be models for agriculture, industrial, industry, and trade, the pioneering core of the vast federation of companies and societies woven into the common cloth of the democratic social republic. Under mutualism, workers would no longer sell the labor to a capitalist, but rather work for themselves in cooperate, cooperatives. <coughs> Proudhon urged workers to form themselves into democratic societies with equal conditions for all members on pain of a relapse into feudalism. This would result in capitalistic and proprietary exploitation, stopped everywhere, the wage system abolished, equal and just exchange guaranteed. Well, it's time for me to call a break. Hold on, Moo Moo. I will, uh, I think that's it for today anyway. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for watching and uh, I'll talk to you later.